Well, um, first developed my interest. It wasn't that I developed my interest. It was that I was exposed to it by becoming involved in punk rock music in 1986. And then, you know, I, I started with Sex Pistols and Basics and that. And then, uh, well, my first punk rock tape was Dead Kennedys. So it's already going through the American filter. And then the Skinhead movement had come here. If you watch, like, the Warriors movie, that's, like, 70s. And uh, it's all kind of been, an, it was all, like, an amalgamation of all Skinhead culture in one sense because the Nazi Skinheads not, had not come out yet. Because if you talk about late 70s, Ian Stewart is still, like, Screwdriver wasn't even the white power yet. So it was all kind of the skinhead thing that came over through punk rock. So I think that there's a big disconnect in that, which is that all my hooligan friends, they talk about boot boys, and but they don't like the music. They listen to Oasis and Happy Mondays, and they don't understand that there's a connection between punk and, like, rock and hard rock music. So with that being said, all my, I got into punk from coming from a lot of the hard forms. My parents were hippies. So I listened to their psychedelic rock. Then I got more into like heavy metal, Motley Crue, Wasp. And then, you know, in 1985, uh, in 1984, a lot of people see my picture. I've, it's posted. And, uh, you know, I have a Motley Crue shot with devil shirt, long hair. I'm 10 years old. And I thought that was the hardest thing. But then I found punk. So then Dead Kennedys, 1986. And then I found Sex Pistols. So then Sid Vicious. And then I buy, you know, I have a Sid Vicious patch on my back. So little by little, to the punk rock, the skinhead thing had already evolved, and the the Nazi skinheads had come out. So then Sharp had not even come out yet, because we're talking about 1986. But I knew that there was, in my area, Nazi skinheads and anti-racist skinheads that were fighting a war, and it overlapped and intertwined with all the gang wars that were going on, like Latin Kings, Folk Nation, Zulu, all these other gangs that were out. It all overlapped. So then... Once I got to punk and I went, I didn't know about skinheads. This is now 1987, my first big show, Circle Jerks on Seven Seconds. And then I went, that show I was a punk rocker. I had exploited shirt, mohawk, Sid Vicious patch on my back, but I, I was looking for something different. And I hated my parents, I hated society. And I, I believed that the hippies were like sellouts, but I felt myself that I was part of the culture, counterculture that came from the beat generation and Jack Kerouac and them, and then went into the psychedelic and hippie generation. And then I felt like the punk was the real, you know, real counterculture. And if you re if you listen to Bedtime for Democracy from Dead Kennedys and that song Chicken Chicken Formus, you know, it, all that stuff spoke to me. And that was my first punk tape, 1986, Bedtime for Democracy. I went looking for Dead Kennedys. I went looking for punk because I had seen Repo Man earlier. So uh, at any rate, through my exposure to punk rock, I became, you know, it's an extremist form of music if you go into, like, the Dead Kennedys and lots of other stuff. You can almost say Dead Kennedys versus Screwdriver in one sense because Nazi punks fuck off and then, you know, Screwdriver music. So then, uh, basically, I got I went to my first big show, uh, Circle Jerks in Seven Seconds, and I seen it. I seen the fucking Fort Lauderdale skinheads, what I became the leader of, which were mixed race. I seen them fighting the Nazis, beating up the Nazis, beating up the bouncers, but... I got in there with them, and I was slam dancing. They're fighting and boot partying people. You know, people got fucking stabbed. It was a pretty rough time period. But I trusted that I, I believed in this culture. And, uh, they, you know, they picked me up if I fell down. I was a little 13-year-old kid. I was smaller than everybody else, too. And I knew I found my calling. And then just little by little, I evolved into the, into the skinhead thing. And uh, to me at the time, I just saw it as a harder form of punk. But... Sharp had not even actually come out yet. So then by 1987, I thought Sharp was a big thing. It actually came out in 1987. But the Fort Lauderdale skinheads were already doing that because the leaders, Scott Shucker, Jewish, uh, Spot, African, Moroccan, and uh, before that even, uh, Steve Conzone, Skin Zone, it was already like an anti-racist scene long before anybody in like uh, New York came out with Sharp in 1987 or the Minneapolis guys came out with the Baldies in 1986, which became ARA, anti-racist action, which was the equivalent of the AFA, anti-fascist action, bef long before Antifa was thought of when it was still anti-fascist action. So as far as the hooliganism goes, then once I progressed past like Sex Pistols and hardcore punk, then I started seeing that the OI was the real deal. 
And then, so already by 1987, you know, I, I advanced quick, and it's funny because now you have the internet, and these cons, these kids don't even know anything. But without the internet, I was able to get all this music because I went and sought it out, and we went hunting for it. But I had Cockney rejects back then, and I didn't think it was that tough because the music is, you have to understand it, it's not as fast and hard in one way. But uh, they were wearing the, the West Ham logos, and, and the thing is, my first football match, as you know, was 1979 which Fort Lauderdale Strikers, I saw George Best play. So the Manchester United logos, I was always into British culture. My parents were hippies. My my uncle lived in London. So I was always like acclimated towards British culture. So the logos, and I've always liked like old school stuff and coats of arms and so forth. So the Manchester United logo always spoke to me and it was around me. I realized as a three, you know, four-year-old kid, five-year-old kid. And then with the punk rock, I just knew that there was something... Once I saw the skinheads in action, and I saw the football logos, I didn't really like the oi music yet because it was like regular pace. I only wanted like really hard, fast stuff. But uh, eventually I figured out it was tougher. And uh, so the hooliganism was always around me in the sense of like Cockney Rejects, with the business, and the oi bands, Blitz, and so forth. And then by the time I became a full-on skinhead and going on and fought and joined gangs and that, and uh, like by 1989, I had the Nick Knight book, Skinhead by Nick Knight, and it goes well into hooliganism. Shows a girl with a dart in her eye, and it tells a whole tale, and shows Skinhead in football. So then I knew that hooliganism, like fighting at football, was where it's at. And then I never vibed with like the American sports. I always hated those people who are jocks, who we call jocks. Jocks here means Scotland. I love Scottish people, but uh. All those cunts were like the people who were the bullies in high schools and the people who run the government, like Democrats and Republican type of people. And, you know, I always hated those guys. And they're big, they take steroids, and they bully everybody. But they won't bully me and my friends, you know. We'll, we'll do something bad to them, and there'll be a full-on war. So they, jocks or, like, the sports people fear gangs in every community. We don't care about school. We're not worried about getting any scholarship or anything like that. So if you mess with us, you know, I mean, we'll come here, we'll do something bad. So with that being said, I was always exposed to it. And then little by little, you know, as Gary Bushel said, you know, with casuals, since it, I suppose since it's not a media-driven thing like with music, um, it leads more to the imagination. And how do you market football hooliganism? Eventually they figured out a way, and they brought it together as a culture. But uh, I was always around it. But it wasn't until... I went so extreme with the anti-racist stuff and we defeated the Nazis and then I became communist and Antifa and all this other stuff. And then those feminists or whatever, neo-feminists you want to call them, these centrists, these Democrats, these liberals, fucked me off out of the movement. Mm -hmm. Then it, once, at that point I was just like, well, this is where I belong. These are people that I can relate to. Yeah, you could call it toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. You could call it ladism. You could call it, you know, lad laddish culture. Mm -hmm. But this is what I fit in with. And honestly, the football factory, not only for me, the football factory brought together the past and created the blueprint for the future. And here I am. Well, it's an interesting question because now the Vice documentary has come out and the question is being raised. And if you look at the Wikipedia entry about hooliganism, it has America first in one sense. So it's like the idea of just what, does the, what even defines hooliganism? Is it just fighting at sports? Well, America would be much more severe than England. We destroy cities over it and there's all these incidents. And that's what America's trying to, like, people are trying to decipher what I'm doing from America. Like, yo, what do you mean Raiders and New York Jets and Boston? Like, the people get killed over that and shoot each other and stuff and tear up cities proper, not just break up windows. But simple violence is not hooliganism to me. Whether it's Russians, whoever it is, there's a culture, terrorist culture. When you say terrorist culture slash hooliganism, football, it's an English thing. And an ultra is an ultra, a barra brava is a barra brava, you know what I mean? But they're not hooligans. If you want to call yourself a hooligan, it's an English thing, mate. Just like if you want to come to England, I think you're supposed to adapt to the culture and become an Englishman, as I've done. 
So, you were the CP company, you know, you see what I got. You say I got the goggle jacket and that, you know. You say I, I got a nice polo, you dress smart and that. So, you know, there's a culture, which is to say that anybody can be a mindless dog, anybody can be violent. It doesn't make you a hooligan to me. If you want to be a true football hooligan, there's a culture and there's a history of the firms that you must pay respect to. For example, the Scottish. Jocks and English are together, obviously, but there it, it was, you know, hooliganism come from England and they're right there, but they're, they're it's inseparable. Scottish and English hooligans, and look at how many firms they got. And they're right in there. Aberdeen is right in there with Liverpool and Manchester as the earliest. So just to say, another country, because for better, is, is Scotland not a different country than England? I don't know. United Kingdom, whatever. So as this English plague spreads, it should not merely be the violence. It should not merely be the sport. There's a culture. There's a language to it. So I think that the Russians... They openly, in their own words, if you watch their videos, they copied. And the Germans, they copied. And the Dutch, they copied. And the American, now me, is copying. The difference is, is that the American hooligan scene, which obviously wasn't discussed in the Vice video, because it's too small, it's too short of a video to talk about everything. But there's been a hooligan scene long before I came around in America. But it's led by Bajarabas from South America and Polish Ultras. You know, I'm the only one in America that cares about the authentic British style. So we're talking about style thing. This is what I say about British gangsters. It, it, it's a bit more sophisticated. It's, it's got a bit of style to it. Anybody could be a savage, but not anybody can have the hair off to the side with a suede head style with a CP company and look good while you're doing it. It's about looking good while you fight. Well, um, at my age, 45 years old, and all the issue, problems I've been in and so forth, I'm not trying to get in any more trouble. And also, I'm a community figure in the sense that I teach martial arts. I train all sorts of people from kids to women to, marsh, to law enforcement to military people. So I don't want to do anything that's going to disrupt the city or cause any sort of unnecessary violence in any other city. However, there is a group that, or let's say there's a faction or a, a segment of society that are young men that have aggression to let out and that like this sort of brotherhood and so forth. So one thing is, oh, go join the military. Well, to what? To go kill people in another country over politics? Well, we're not killing anybody with football hooliganism, although it may get go further and that's the problem you start using weapons you start going further and further you start attacking pubs you start uh, involving innocent parties so if it was on as it is on paper if it just could be a firm that would see another firm and you go somewhere else and no uninvolved parties would be injured or anything like that then it would be fine but it's not like that the fact is you're smashing people's pubs that are working class people that have nothing to do with it. So as far as, you know, lads keeping it alive and doing those things, taking people's ends, fighting at football, you know, I'm not stopping them and I'm not telling them it's the wrong thing to do. But what I'm doing is a defensive thing. If you look at the Millwall 1977 video, at least the way it's portrayed, you see that there's the halfway line and you see that there's the, the treatment firm and you see that there's the F troop. It says F troop are the nutters, the psychopaths. They go looking for a fight. So my IMF firm is not that. And then you see that there's a halfway line. Younger lads want to prove themselves. My firm is not that. But then it says treatment will go anywhere where Millwall and where Millwall supporters go. And they don't go looking for a fight. But they're always there if it happens. That they're a defensive firm. So then my idea is that. I'll go with my supporters, 
men, women, children, the team, because you already know English player, what was it, Chelsea, got stabbed recently. So that, that shouldn't happen on my watch. So it's, my firm is defensive. And your football firm, in one sense, acts as an auxiliary police force. Because it's not the police's job to protect football supporters from the, the city that you're going into, especially when things have happened in the past and other cunts have done bad things there. Well, uh, it was a theory. Um, and this has to do with me respecting the Russian hooligans as number one. So then, that right there creates a problem. Although my Plymouth boys agree with it, and it says, yes, we have to adopt the Russian tactics. It's only the Plymouth that I see who's open-minded to that. They're the smartest ones from what I see. They're the most like Miami. The other English don't acknowledge that Marseille was an embarrassment. They have a million excuses. Oh, all of our top hooligans, uh, banning orders, and it's true. But you got our passports taken on, Putin supporting them. But you're still making a bunch of excuses that you got run, you know, with, with a small number against a big number in their train. And what do you expect? Sorry, these English lads, a lot of them are just a bunch of pissheads. In the sense, what a pisshead means is, you know, for everybody who doesn't know what that means, they don't want to sniff and smoke cigars and drink and. They don't work out. And so what do you expect when you're facing a trained force that's more or less straight edge? You know, because what I see is like all these Russian hooligans actually are in straight edge culture. Besides that, they're fighters, like MMA fighters. And then you got Muslims who, for all intents and purposes, Islam is almost like straight edge. Which is, so you got people who are not doing drugs and drinking and smoking cigarettes and doing all things and getting pissed up, and not focusing on sex, and they're just interested in fighting and training, well, how are you going to defeat a force like that? Just, you know, hope, hope to do so, what, by weapons and stuff? So, you know. Everybody loves it, kind of. You know, everybody basically says that the geezer's taking the piss out of me and that. Other people says I should batter him. And, but, you know, they don't understand that I allowed myself to be filmed and so forth. And, you know, I never told those people that if I didn't like, like I've told every journalist. You know, you do a story, like I've told you, you do a story on me. If, if you do something I don't like, I won't work with you again. But you're never going to be like, in fear of me attacking you physically like it it i i volunteer for it so with that being said um some people are like oh they're taking the piss out of you they're da -da -da -da. but uh overall everybody says it's cool because they everybody who's friends with me has been a part of this they've watched it come up for me claiming miami casuals a year ago and they watched it morph into all this and grow into this and now there's new people who don't know anything about it so then all the people who've been with me this whole time basically like already know the story. So uh, it's been overall positive, even though, you know, like it's taking the piss out of me or making fun of me in some way. And they only use the parts that made me look psychotic. They actually filmed me for three days and I had a lot of intellectual conversation like this and so forth. But, you know, it's a 20 minute piece and it would be too confusing to show me in too many different regards. So, um... The over, you know, it boosted up my profile for what I'm doing, and it's confirmed to everybody involved that this is something real. Like, they weren't just pretending, like, they weren't believing in something that wasn't real. They don't know what to think of me. So, you know, it's uh, any time that a gangster, or outlaw figure, somebody in the counterculture comes before the mainstream media and vice is mainstream media, you know, even if it's youth oriented. Um, it, you know, they're not my publicists. They're not my film crew. I didn't pay them. So, uh, for me, it was good overall. Although oh, I would like them to capture more of certain elements and show more of me. But uh, overall, it, it's been a positive reaction. And, you know, I think a lot of the other lads, English lads and stuff, are, has, 
it has to make them proud somewhat that somebody's like so into their culture and because it was kind of like dead you know they they try to market it and it succeeded in the time of from football factory to the firm to all the casuals videos and the, the club were coming back out and weekend defender and you know cheers to weekend defender and some of these other brands you know what i mean so it's like i think that i'm bringing a new resurgence to the culture i think i'm bringing something new into it i think i'm fanning new flames and keeping it alive although a lot of the older lads are like who the fuck you think you are and it's always gonna keep going on with or without you so uh it's a mixed bag but overall positive Um, you know, I, I I came to meet these geezers and join the firm, hopefully, if it worked out, and I, it was more than I thought it would be, and had to go through a bit more than I thought, but, uh, you know, when it dust settled, and they accepted me in, they gave me my badges, and gave me my clobber, gave me my jackets and that, um, you know, I love it, I, I, I feel like I'm the first American you know, other Americans have been associated with hooligan firms through music or whatever like that. But I think I'm the only one who's ever actually come here and, like, actually done it, done it, done it. And uh, so then, you know, I have utmost respect for Central Element, TCE. Goes back to the A38s, even before that. A crazy gang. You got Under Fives. You got TYE. So, I don't know. This is what I meant to do. I didn't know it was going to turn out this way. You know, it wasn't easy, but uh, here I am, I joined an English hooligan firm. I figured that Plymouth was the closest to Miami in the sense of a coastal community, the weather, the people. I just felt like Plymouth was the equivalent of Miami, as I, you know, I know lads from every firm and that. And then uh, after moving here, it's a tough area. People might think it's not because there's not a lot of stabbings or shootings, but people don't really talk. If you if you grasp here, if you call the police here, it would be a problem. Well, um, I didn't have a ticket, and I don't really expect to have to pay for football, because to me, it's like a punk rock concert, you know, like, I'm the boss, why should I have to pay? But it's a bit different, the hooligans still have to pay for, for their football tickets. It's a bit different in America. Anyway, so then, uh, I just went out where the boys would be, and it pulled in there, and I met up with the youth, I'm not going to say which firm, because they don't want to be publicized. I met up with those boys, they knew who I was took pictures of that, and he says, oh, you going? I says, yeah, I want to go. So then I, I neck my bottle of Lambrini. They said, don't drink that, it makes you look like a tramp. So, and then he says, yeah, he was trying to get me a ticket. Once we walk up to the front, I'm walking with all these young boys. And, uh, you know, these guys are 16, 17, I think, 18 and stuff. And once we start getting to the front, uh, as it is, the bill, the police is looking at them and stuff, because they know who they are. They're the troublemakers. And they says, oh, I made it. Why don't you just go under? And you just sneak in, you know? I says, what'll happen while I get arrested? And they says, no. I said, you just get chucked out? He says, yeah. I says, all right. And then we had a whole scheme. We had it all worked out that the guy was going to go in the front, the guy was going to go back. But the problem is they sort, they took me out. The bill separated me from them when we walked up. And then I had to do a junkie stunt what we call a junkie, it's not like a crack out move. Ooh, like, act like, and then the fucking turnstile is different. I've never seen the turnstile. Like, like, I've seen ones in New York similar, but this one went so low, and I and I just said, fuck it. And the person collecting the tickets is right there. I, did, I tried to duck under, and I did duck under, but bang, 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 my shoulders are too big. So I come up on the other side, police are all over me, blah, 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 blah. But I talked to them, they were cool about it. But anyway, so it's just like, and the other boys try to come up and say, no, 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 let them come in. 
And uh, anyway, it didn't work out. I got kicked out, but they were friendly about it. Juicy Island, Channel Island Massive, Stinging Nettles, me and the Jersey Devil, aka Jordy, aka 12V. Also, you got the brains of the operation. His name is Jonesy, you understand? He's Brighton. You got J Mo, and these guys are all a football club, and they're also all the hip hop boys of uh, Jersey Island. And there's a whole Channel Island, Jersey Island style that it's mixed with grime and American hip hop. And they're not limited to any of it. And what I saw is that as far as underground music, the Northern Soul and the drum and bass are the two dominant scenes. And they're very elitist. And they kind of don't want to let other kids come up. So what I was trying to do is like unify the punk and the death metal and the skateboarding and the hip hop and the dubstep and the grime and put all it together. But ultimately, you know, I'm a hip hop MC. And then I found Jordy, uh, Jersey Devil, who I call Jersey Devil. They call him Tovey. And uh, he's into the same hip hop as me. And brother, I moved into his flat and we just rapped for a fucking week straight. And we made some songs. There's more that I haven't put out yet. But, uh, you know, as far as the Channel Island style and the Jersey Island style, Jersey style, it's yet to be documented in terms of, like, hip-hop and grime. But it's there. And, brother, I'll be back. And that's only the beginning. I walked around the whole neighborhood extensively all day. I stayed there like eight or nine hours and uh, I just kept drinking cans. I didn't see any pubs, like two pubs. And the only pubs I saw, I didn't see anybody like in there. But I went on both sides. I went in a tunnel and there's a whole area of graffiti. And then I went to the front before the match because there's a cafe right in front of the stadium. But then I, you, you can't buy cans around there. So I kept walking up to the front where all the fans come. Where they're selling scarves and that, and there's a, like a T, and it leads to the stadium. So I just stood there, but I saw everybody approaching the match. But I never saw any firm, I never saw any lads. I saw like families and like two or three people. And I was hanging out in front of the cafe before I made the first video. I was hanging out in front, I met some skinheads, but they didn't know my video, they didn't know about hooliganism. And then I, I was announcing who I was. And other people were figuring it out. But nobody said anything funny to me. Well, Antifa, Antifa means something different to the general public in England now. Because I don't know that everybody knew about it in the past, but as you know, and I've mentioned, there's four manifestations. There's the original 1932 Action Antifascisti, where the flag came from, which was a, the, the Communist Party in Germany, the armed wing against the Nazis, which if that original Antifa would have won, there never would have been a Holocaust. So, but obviously we're defeated, and Nazi Germany became Nazi Germany. So then the second manifestation is 1985 in England, anti-fascist action, AFA. So then we were parallel to them, basically all the toughest punks, which became anti-racist skinheads. We all fought a worldwide gang war, a nationwide, international gang war against the Nazi skinheads. And we created all these different movements from anti-fascist action, the second generation in 1985, Angelic Upstarts, Oppressed, with Rest in Peace Nancy, Word up to my main man, the godfather of Antifa, which is Roddy Moreno. People don't even know there is such a thing. Anyway, because there are a bunch of fucking liberals and college kids that, that copied our shit. And now we're not even involved in it. So no wonder they're losing. Because these 
cunts don't know how to win any war, because all they're doing is relying on police. We didn't rely on police. We defeated the Nazis at their houses and fucking the club to club. So anyway, then you get the third manifestation, which is when they start saying Antifa, which is like 2000s in Germany, and the anarchists and other people started coming in and basically expanding the definition of what fascism meant. And then I kind of saw all that happening. And then we had already like defeated all the Nazis nationwide, me and all the different anti-racist skinhead gangs and hardcore groups like FSU and all these different skinhead gangs from across the country. And we joined with other black and Latino gangs and we defeated the Nazi skinheads. And then once we had them defeated, I got further into the leftist side of it. And then I was like saying like, yo, we need to like unify with these other people and everything and overthrow all of it. And uh, that didn't work out because a lot of these so-called leftists, they're actually centrists, they're liberals. They have a lot of stupid ideas like overthrowing patriarchy and being against hierarchy and lateral organization. And they look to the Spanish Revolution, which failed. So anyway, it, it was a flawed idea. But uh, what I knew about anti-fascist action was the 80s. And then we were ARA, anti-racist action. We were sharp, skinheads against racial prejudice. We're the ones who defeated the actual Nazis. And then later on, once we had them defeated, I saw the stuff happening in Europe. And at the time, Antifa was like a little joke in America. There was like 50 people. And they're like girls and like, I don't know, soft people. And no, no skinheads respected. And it was just within the skinhead scene. But there were some tough people. Like Jose Antifa, she's the, like my some of my friends is like Rash. Rash is what started Antifa in 1993 in New York City. Red and anarchist connects. So then I saw that, and then I was getting deeper in that. And some of my friends were saying like, "Yo, you don't have to be a communist. You don't have to be an anarchist. It's just the opposite of Nazis." And I was like, "Okay." And they always called us communists anyway. So I was like, "Okay, I'll be a communist." So then little by little. I, I sought that out, but they, they were scared of me joining. There's only like 50 people in, in the whole America. They were scared of me joining because I was a Stalinist. I didn't even know what Stalinist was. But then once they called me a Stalinist, I was like, okay, that's what I am. So then once I joined, then I turned that Florida into that, and we became the strongest chapter. And then I tried to spread it all across the country, and I did. When I went to L.A., there was zero Antifa. When I went to Seattle, zero Antifa, 2013. When I went to San Francisco Bay Area, zero Antifa. So I started teaching them all about it, but all of them thought it was a skinhead thing. So I was like, no, look at Germany, look at Europe, like, it's for everybody, it's for anarchists, it's for everybody. So I seeded it, and then I went to the first Bay Area before the, so I participated in Black Block stuff, and like I said, I was there and that. So Black Block existed in Seattle, Black Bloc existed in Bay Area. Black Bloc actions had existed in L.A., but they had nothing to do with no anti-fascist action. So I went and hung out with them, and maybe I did some of the stuff with them. And maybe we destroyed areas in Oakland and San Francisco that are on video. I'm not going to say what was there or not. And then I started telling them, like, yo, Antifa is for everybody. Antifa is for you as well. So then I went to the, I was at the first meeting of Bay Area Antifa, you know, in Berkeley. Actually, it was in San Francisco. And none of those geezers were, had ever been involved in it. Like, they all learned on the internet. I was looking around, like, with their boots and braces and my patches on my flight jacket. I got anti fucking like, propaganda on them. Like, yo, who, who do you know? I'm like, all you guys learned this shit off the internet. I thought they were all cops. And I was like, fuck this shit. And I was like, yo, man. I was like, who's ready to fight one-on-one -on -one to join Antifa? I'll fight you right now and initiate all of you. I'm like, huh, what do you mean? It's not about that. I'm like, what? Okay, so you, you want to you say you're going to fight against cops and fight against Nazis, but you won't fight me now one on one right here. The loser has to buy the one beer. And so, anyway, so I spread it, but it, was, it failed. And then, uh, as a result, you know, time went on. And these neo feminists and these liberals and these Democrats and George Soros or whoever basically pushed all the real antifas out of the movement so now i got nothing to do with the so-called u.s antifa movement
or wreck any of them. It's soft. I'll fight any. I already said I'll fight any Antifa leader of any chapter in America to be the national president. But now I don't want nothing to do with it. Now it's con it's confused with Joseph Stalin created the term anti-fascism. So I'm in line with Antifa, anti-fascist action generation one, 1932, which is Action Antifascisti, which was the armed wing of the German Communist Party against the Nazis. A bunch of dudes, look like hooligans, all male, yeah, all white. Got nothing to do with being white or black, but all this other stuff that they're trying to say has something to do with Antifa was all created by the third manifestation in Germany when they started expanding the definition of fascism. Well, you know, you say it's you not know, anti-capitalist, anti, you know, it's it, the environment and LGBT and all that. Well, I'd just like to say what would Joseph Stalin do? Because Joseph Stalin is who coined the term anti-fascism. Joseph Stalin is the anti-fascist, is the socialist leader. He's the one who defeated the Nazis on the Eastern Front when America was supporting the Nazis. When they had American, they had rallies in Madison Square Garden, Prescott Bush, America was supporting the Nazis. So the hammer and sickle is the symbol of the far left, it's a symbol of anti fascism, and the swastika is the symbol of the far right. I'm a scientific socialist. Can you show me good on a meter? Can you weigh out good? It's not feeling based. No fantasy, no feelings, no race, no identity politics. It's what's logically pragmatic for the survival of the state and the overthrow of the ruling class from the working class. And if I have to cut off a million people's heads of any color, of any race, of any gender, we don't look at that. All we look at is the working class and the ruling class. That's scientific. That's logical. Anybody talking about feelings, I don't believe in the feelings. I don't believe in being offended. I've never complained to the police or the media that somebody offended me, I'll go fucking shoot their house up. I'll go stomp their fucking head in there. And that's the end of it. Violence rules, might is right. It's supposed to be a gang. I'd rather not be a terrorist group, but nothing to do with me. I'm... You know, whoever's claiming Antifa, is, it depends what country you're talking about. The German Antifa is good or was, I don't know, it, this immigrant thing and this Muslim thing disrupts the whole facade of Antifa because it's not really one ideology. Where the right wing and the far right has like a, a definite ideology, when you try to lump all of us together as left wing, or anti-fascist, okay, but are you Stalinist, or are you Trotskyist, are you a social democrat, are you trans, are you this, that, we're not really one thing, and when it came down to it, they all betrayed me, all these feminists and all these people who never actually did any violent acts, I've been in prison, my friends were dead, I've risked my life over and over and over for, I gave 30 years of service to it. Only to have these so-called neo-feminists or liberals, whatever you want to call them, say because of my views, they call me misogynist, but I'm a gangster, I call women bitches. I don't call your sister, your family, your daughter that, but when I'm from strip of girls, porn bitches, they're not going to respect you if you don't treat them that way. They'll think you're soft. So, you know, it's, it's what they, I guess, it's what they deserve, which is going to be what's happening. The far left and the far right taking power.
Well, um, I've been prison in the Florida prison system, and uh, other prison systems are different. Like federal is kind of not as hard as a as a lot of state like Florida, California, Texas, and then um, so some places are different. But basically, the white inmates are all getting kind of fucked by black guys and targeted, and they don't stick together. The only ones that stick together is Aryan Brotherhood and like Nazi lowriders and P Pinai, like Public MM1. So then the main Latin gangs or Spanish gangs and Latino gangs and Latin kings and so forth. So from my experience, and like what happens in the majority of California, like Sureños, Trece, which is blue, which is LA and above, um, the Latino gangs and the Aryan Brotherhood stick together against the blacks when it comes down to it. So then I got sharp, I got anti-racist tattoos all over me. But uh, skinhead in prison means something different. Like there's people that have no connection with the skinhead culture. They're just like KKK and Nazis and Aryan Brotherhood that call themselves skinheads. So then if anybody wants to be the anti-racist skinhead in jail, good luck. Well, for me, I'm already Latino. So instantly, I go with my Latino people. Which is, I'm a Zulu, but, you know, it goes with Latin kings, folk nation, nieta, familia. It's going to be all the Latin gangs sticking together. MS-13, DSE Ocho's, 18th Street. So we're going to be the ones with all the knives, controlling a lot of the drugs. And we'll stick together against the blacks. Anytime, and then I've seen that the whites Aryan Brotherhood rolls together with the Latinos against the blacks. However, in Florida, the Miami blacks is the strongest thing. So then I know a lot of those dudes because I'm from Miami. So then I would roll with them. So it, it, it's a bit complex, but uh, basically, the Nazis would see my tattoos and kind of like check me. But I'm already with all the Latinos who, so they know what I am, and it's a weird thing because they kind of accept me, and I'll roll with anybody like to get knowledge, you know. So I hung out with the five percenters, five percent nation, nation of gods and earth, which came off of nation of Islam, which is a black Muslim thing. But they got nothing to do with regular Islam because they say that five percent nation Wu Tang. Wu Tang, Erica Badu, Tribe Called Quest, all the New York rappers, they're all five percenters, five percent nation, nation of gods and earth. And what they believe in is science, mathematics. So they say that regular Muslims, Sunnis and Shias, Jews, Christians are praying to a mystery God that doesn't exist. And to them, Islam means I, self, Lord, and Master. God is man, man is God. Allah, arm, leg, leg, arm, head, man. So then that's considered apostate by actual Islam. Mm -hmm. So then it, it, it's a complicated thing when I go to jail because I'm weird. I'm in a bunch of different crazy gangs. and So as far as like Nazis, I've hung out with a lot of them in jail. I'm not involved in the Communist Party anymore. I was the leader of CPUSA, Communist Party USA in Miami. But uh, I got ran out of the leftist movement by these stupid neo-feminists and college kids and stuff. So I got nothing to do with that Communist Party. And yeah, they're connected with the Democrat Party and they're a bunch of liberals. But there are good lads in there. They're skinheads and stuff. But I think most of them are left. But they have nothing, none of them don't believe in Stalinism. None of them are Stalinists. They're all like fucking Trotskyists, if that. I think that a lot of them are more like Democrats or liberals. So uh, the people I met in CPUSA, Communist Party USA, the history of CPUSA has to do with the unions in the United States. And uh, all the ones I met were good people, working class people, honest people, many of them Christians. Uh, you know, some of them were violent, like my skinhead friends that brought me into it. But... CPUSA, great party, good people, constitutionalists, um, 
their doctrine, they called it Bill of Rights Socialism. I wanted to call it Democratic Communism. But they felt like it was a mis like a redundant, because to them, communism implies democracy. But most people wouldn't see it that way. So, um, I have the utmost respect for CPUSA. But, you know, I was pushed out, and I'm a Stalinist, and I don't have the same views as them. They're democratic. So, I have no connection with any communist party at this point. Well, FSU Nation 378, um, those are lads that are contemporaries of mine, CBC, Colorblind Crew, South Florida, as well as like, Minneapolis Baldies, Anti-Racist Action, as well as spent, sent a shout out to fucking Unity Crew, Unity 21, California. It's all these anti-racist skinhead gangs from across America that we all came together, basically we all fought Nazi skinheads, you got, uh, you got the Fear City skinheads in Chicago, I could go on and on, um, and then basically what FSU was, is the hardcore kids that also fought the Nazis, so it was like all of us anti-racist skinhead gangs, you could kind of label us all as sharp skinheads against racial prejudice, but everybody didn't claim that, um, and then it's like, uh, you had Joe Hardcore, who you can see in the Gangland documentary. He was the leader of uh, Philly, FSU, and he used to be in a crew, an older crew, he still is, you know, of Nine Circles. So I knew Nine Circles, they were Philly. And then you had other crews around, and basically the tech crew, taking every crown, that was New Jersey, Joe Nunn. So then, basically, from FSU, which was Fuck Shit Up Nation, uh, Fuck Shit Up, and then Friends Stand United eventually, Boston, Albany, uh, Boston, Albany, there's another key city uh, missing uh, of FSU. But uh, at any rate, so you had the original FSU three cities, and then Joe Hardcore came into the into FSU. And basically, like, step to, you know, Bruce, and he's like, yo, let's make a nationwide gang and just control hardcore and fuck all the Nazis and everything else. And then, uh, me and Joe Hardcore already knew each other because he had, he was in Punishment before he was in Shattered Realm, which is the FSU band. And then he would come down to us, like South Florida. He had been, he had OBHC on his neck, Oakland brand hardcore. So it's like, it was this whole anti-racist, like, fighting against Nazis. They weren't into the politics. But little by little, then it was just like, it would have been a fight. Like, all the FSU Nation came down in Magic Fest to South Florida, which was a big show. And Blood for Blood played, my band Colorblind Cutthroats played, Youth of Today played, and the FSU came. And, like, it would have been a fight. But when the dust cleared, we made friends. And I was like, okay, well, this shit's spreading. I might as well start it here. So then uh, I flew to Boston and joined, did what I had to do in Boston like I've done here, and then I uh, came back and spread it in South Florida and this and that, and um, collectively we defeated the Nazis, we defeated all the Nazi skinhead gangs in America, in my territory we defeated CHS, Confederate Hammerskins, Blood and Honor, Combat 18, American Front, World Church the Creator, I can go on and on, but like, so FSU to me, like, was the final defeat of all the Nazis, because, like, all the so-called skinheads, anti-racist skinheads, and, like, New York and Philadelphia and stuff, they wouldn't actually fight the Nazis, they'd hang out with them. But the hardcore kids wouldn't. So then you had Philly, which was Nine Circles, Joe Hardcore, they fought KSS, Keystone State Skinheads. That's still a big Nazi skinhead gang, uh, Nazi group, you know? And then you had uh, Tech taking every crown, Joe Nunn, he was the leader of that, uh, Second and Nunn, hardcore bands like that. And then they were fighting the ACSH, Atlantic City skinheads, and they all came together. So basically to me, 
FSU Nation, even though I'm not in it now, different politics happen. I was a leader of seven states at one point, the whole southeastern United States. But, you know, with all these gang leaders, it's never easy to organize the whole thing. So I ended up not being part of it. Or, but I'm still friends with a lot of those lads. And, you know, I, I still rep of FSU in some sense, you know, respect 378. But basically when FSU came out, they, they brought together all the anti-racist skinhead gangs and local street gangs and anti-racist hardcore kids. And we all crushed the Nazis once and for all. And to me, that's the legacy of FSU. Well, me and my friends all had my boy Dennis, who time do rag Dennis, he was do rag posse. I was Zulu chapter three. We were street gangs, you know, from late eighties, early nineties. He was like kind of the most ruthless West Palm gangs. I was like in the most ruthless Fort Lauderdale gangs. Both of us would fight Miami gangs, all kind of stuff. But um, I used to actually go up there and hang out with them, and uh, they were really a bit more severe than everybody thought. You know, like shooting a lot of people, fully automatic weapons, and so then uh, we had a lot of footage from going to shows. He would always bring a video camera. And we had just a bunch of fights and stuff. And then I saw Bum Fights, a movie called Bum Fights. And then I saw the hell of street fighting people were like bragging, oh, this good movie has good street fighting. And then I called him up. I'm like, yo, homie, you need to see this movie. And then I showed him the movie. I was like, yo, our fights are better than that, and they leased all that footage. I was like, yo, let's, let's put our shit like, into a movie, and I'll talk, and we'll show all the shit. So then that became a trailer, which is not available online. Maybe I'll put it online. It's called uh, Drunken Disorderly. So we started with that, and then that became Dirty South Street Brutality. So then Dirty South Street Brutality was the first one, and then... Like, the police all saw it, and the mayor saw it up West Palm, and, and uh, they thought it was kind of, she thought it was good because it was exposing it, and they wanted more, like, budget, and the media was trying to say that West Palm, Palm Beach kind of like is a nice place, and it is in some places, but it's really deadly in other places. The whole South Florida is. So then uh, we came out with Gangsters and Thugs, mm-hmm. and by the time we made the first movie, like all the black boys didn't know what we were doing so they were like leery of us but once they saw the movie that we were like bigging it up then they're all coming out with guns and we know somebody with a rocket propelled grenade what can you expect expect the unexpected you never know what to expect, you understand? The culture, the terrorist culture, the football hooliganism, that's where it's at. So, in order for me to get to the root of it, I have to take it further. Now, where that lies, I don't know. But if you're an English man and you're at a World Cup game, you see the Yanks coming, just take us as another local English territory because England and America is one it's always been that way we're both red white and blue so the Yanks are coming to reinforce the English hooligans just remember that